Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by William Withu Fenn. The Steel Mirror, A Christmas Dream. We have most of us, at one time or other, had some experience in curious coincidences, mere matters of accident, which have fallen out so strangely as to wear the appearance of a forelaid scheme. Coincidences which have given rise in men's minds to the idea of destiny, fate, or whatever we may please to call it. Coincidences which, be they what they may, have, without doubt, been the basis of superstition from time immemorial. Presentments, in a measure, are common to everybody, and even the most matter-of-fact individual may occasionally be swayed by them in spite of himself. Now, I flattered myself that I was one of these same individuals. I laid claim to no superfluous imaginations and fancies. I was no believer in ghosts or spirit rapping. Yet I leave it for others to judge whether what I am about to tell is, or is not, to be accounted for by purely natural laws, worked out by chance and combination of time, place, and circumstance. Ever since I can remember, it had been our habit to spend Christmas with our old friends the sequins, generally at their seat called the Bower, not far from the principal town of a celebrated hunting county, about a hundred miles from London. It was a picturesque and thorough specimen of a time-honored manor house, with scarcely a room, corridor, or passage that had not a legend of some kind attached to it. The family, too, was one of the most ancient in England, and many were the tales connected with the daring deeds performed and the knightly prowess displayed by its ancestors. My father and old George Sequin were contemporaries, and had religiously kept up the custom, which, I believe, had been even handed down to them by their fathers, of always dining together on Christmas Day. From them, Godfrey Sequin and I had again inherited the idea that things would go extremely wrong if the festive season was not spent in each other's company. He particularly had strong opinions on the point, and his anxiety that nothing should interfere with the custom sometimes bordered upon the superstitious. Heirs to the jovial and kindly feelings of our fathers, we had carefully maintained this principle, but, as long ago my circumstances had changed so far as to render it impossible for me to entertain Godfrey and his wife in anything like their own style of living, the hospitality had been all on his side, and it had become a settled plan that we should go down to the Bower for a fortnight every Christmas. I had been married some few years when, just before one of these much-looked-forward-to expeditions, my wife was taken suddenly, but not dangerously, ill, and there seemed every probability of our good old custom being broken through for the first time. The doctors pronounced it madness for her to think of taking a journey in the state of health she then was. Letters passed to and fro between the Bower and Bloomsbury Square, devices and suggestions for surmounting the difficulty, arose on both sides. I was to go with one of my girls, the other to remain with her mother. Sir Godfrey and Lady Sequin were to come to us. Some plan must be adopted, if possible, to prevent our being separated at Christmas. I did not myself feel the absolute necessity of this, but the Sequins held strong opinions about it. It would be terribly unlucky. We ought not to break through the rule whilst there was still the slightest chance of maintaining it. Godfrey was even more urgent than his wife, and his letters had in them the most imploring tone, bespeaking, as I fancied, over an anxiety and fear that something dire might happen if I failed to occupy my usual seat at his Christmas table. Affairs remained in this uncertain state until within a few days of the 25th December when my wife, having somewhat recovered, settled the difficulty by deciding, with that combined spirit of self-sacrifice and determination which some women display in emergencies, that considering Godfrey's earnest wish, I ought to go down alone for a day or two at least. Her kind heart at once led her to set aside all her own feelings on the matter. She could not bear to think that my friend's happiness should be interfered with by any dislike she might feel at being left alone at such a time. She said that she should become quite superstitious herself if she were to cause the breach of this old established custom. After all, she continued, what is it but a few days' absence? I should think nothing of it in any other season, and it is only imagination which leads one to attribute more importance to it just now. And I, you know, have very little imagination, whilst your friend Godfrey and his wife are made up of it. 
Reluctantly, then, I settled to go. I say reluctantly, for the moment I had consented, a strange and unusual feeling of depression came over me. I could not but admit the common sense of my wife's words, but nevertheless a, to me, ridiculous foreboding of evil, or, at the least, a sense of discomfort, rooted itself in my mind. Apart from the joviality of Christmas meetings, I was the last person in the world to attribute any serious importance to their not being kept up. Still I failed to get over the disquiet which the present arrangement had created. However, I bade my wife and girls goodbye on the 23rd, determining, that as Christmas Day fell on the Wednesday, to return at the end of the week, instead of remaining as usual for the customary program of hunting, shooting, etc. On my way down, everything seemed to combine to lower my spirits, the only other occupants of the railway carriage being a young widow lady and her two little children. Her grief was very fresh, and it was with the greatest difficulty once or twice that she restrained herself from hysterical paroxysms of tears. The weather, too, was muggy and gloomy. Thick mists had settled determinedly over all parts of the flat country through which my journey lay. Do what I would, I could not help contrasting the present state of the atmosphere with the crisp, frosty brightness and invigorating air, which I remembered had set my usually elastic disposition bounding like a child's when I traveled over the same ground a year ago. The hearty welcome at the bower only temporarily dismissed this demon of disquiet from my elbow, and I so continually relapsed into silence during dinner that two or three of my old friends assembled at the house, and Godfrey especially, noticed my dejection, but dealt lightly with it, as of course my wife's absence, being universally regretted, at the same time also accounted for my own unwanted demeanor. The mirth generally, for some reason, was not as great, it struck me, as on previous occasions. The following day, which was Christmas Eve, we were still very dull, and my own feelings considerably worse. I had grown horribly anxious, for the morning's post had brought no letter from my wife, although she had promised to write a line in the afternoon the day I started. There was really nothing in this circumstance, yet somehow or other I was so unhinged that it had an effect upon me quite inconsistent with its importance. There were no means by which my mind could be speedily set at rest, for these were the early days of electric telegraphy, and the system of communication was very incomplete. Dankbro, the county town, was as yet without wires, and we were forty miles from the nearest telegraph station. The arguments of Lady Sequin and her husband all failed to rouse and cheer me up, and in the most unnatural way, my dejection rather communicated itself to them, for they began to feel that perhaps it had been a little selfish on their part to insist on my presence under the circumstances. It was the most dismal Christmas Eve we could remember. We voted it so by acclamation, vainly endeavoring to extract a joke from our universal opinion. On retiring for the night, my condition of mind, far from improving, became so deplorable that I thought I was losing my senses or going to have a serious illness. The picturesque, old-fashioned room allotted to me, called the Mirror Chamber, was, I knew, noted in the annals of the house for several legends attached to it. None of these, however, lived individually in my mind, but highly wrought as it then was, this recollection communicated an uncanny ghostly appearance to the place, which it would not have borne, indeed, which it had never borne to me, on ordinary occasions. In my present morbidly unhealthy state, it required a great effort to put out my candle and turn into bed. After this was accomplished, the flickering light of the fire at times became so distressing that I could not persuade myself that I was alone in the room. I got out of bed, undrew the curtains, drew them back again, shifted the furniture, and generally worked myself into such a state of fever that I quite lost all self-command, although at the same time feeling perfectly ashamed of the weak, unmanly part I was playing. Back again in bed, I tossed and tumbled from side to side, and when at last, worn out, I did begin to doze, the moaning of the wind in the casement, or the soft lapping sound of the dying embers falling upon the hearth, disturbed me with a start and a shock, which vibrated through my frame, as if there had been an earthquake. I don't know how long I had been asleep, if asleep I really was, and this is the point which will ever remain a mystery in my mind, 
when a dream of such terrible reality came upon me that to forget it, or, indeed, to believe that it was a dream, is next to impossible. At any rate, I was conscious of my exact position, conscious of the unnatural state of my mind, conscious of how and where I was, lying flat on my back, staring straight through the aperture, between the curtains, at the foot of my bed, conscious that I saw the bed dimly reflected in that relic of antiquity, a steel mirror, hanging opposite. If I was in a dream, I was dreaming that I was awake, and awake in precisely the same place, and under the same circumstances, in which I knew myself to be. The same thoughts, the same feelings, the same surroundings were as vividly reproduced as any events in the most startling dreams ever are, the only difference being that instead of dreaming of remote affairs and conditions, I was dreaming of the present, the positive, tangible present. Here, then, I was lying, asleep or awake, as you please, when I became aware of a dim mist gradually overspreading the mirror, such as might be produced by human breath, increasing now, and then decreasing, just as if the action of the lungs in respiration made it fluctuate. This effect had continued for a minute or more, when I observed the reflected palm of a stealthy hand passed, as it were, straight across the steel, as though to wipe away the obscuring vapor, and then I saw upon the now unclouded steel a face. Not the face itself, but palpably the reflex of one, as we may see our own in any glass. It appeared to be gazing at its eyes, yet there was no intervening form, no figure visible of which, I felt certain, this vision was but a reproduction. Starting upright in bed, convulsively clutching the clothes, whilst drops of perspiration broke out upon my forehead, and my tongue clove to the roof of my mouth, I remained horror-stricken, for the face hitherto unrecognizable now clearly showed itself to be that of a woman. The head and cheeks were partially enveloped in something white. Rapidly increasing in distinctness, the white head covering grew into the similitude of widow's weeds, as worn a few centuries ago, and the features, great powers. I shudder as I recall my sensations. Plainly and unmistakably, assumed the form of those of my wife. The terrible truth of the likeness was made more manifest for a while, as the shape seemed to draw nearer. A spirit of flame, at the same time, springing brightly from the grate, showed the apparition with startling vividness. It was the last spark of light in the fire, which, burning brightly for one moment, instantly afterwards disappeared, leaving the room in total darkness. I fell back in a swoon, from which I only slowly recovered, as the dreary morning light was creeping through the shutters. Paralyzed though I was, by a multitude of bewildering sensations, I at last managed to dress myself and hastened downstairs, firmly resolving that if the post brought no reassuring news from home, I would go back to town immediately. It would be mere mockery attempting to enter into Christmas festivities under this roof. I knew, from her active habits, that I should find Lady Sequin astir before anyone else, and I went straight to her morning room to communicate my intentions. She was unlocking the letter bag as I entered, and her surprise at my early visit gave way, the moment she looked at my face, to a suppressed ejaculation of fear. "'What is the matter?' she exclaimed. "'You are as pale as a ghost. Are you ill?' "'Yes, I think I am, dear Lady Sequin,' I replied. "'But pray tell me, is there a letter from Maria?' We ran over the contents of the bag together. No, there was nothing for me. Then, taking her hand, I continued. "'I must have the dog-cart round at once to catch the next train for London.' "'Going back? And today? What for? Why, Godfrey will never forgive you.' "'I can't help it. I dare say it is very foolish, but you know the uncomfortable circumstances under which I came. You must have seen how distressed I have been for the last four and twenty hours. There is still no letter for me, and I cannot, after what I went through last night, endure this uncertainty any longer. Something has happened, or will happen, if I don't return at once. Gone through? And what have you gone through? Why, such a night as I trust I may never pass again. Then, as the best means of explaining my reasons for leaving, I detailed my sensations, 
and the revelation of the mirror, adding my conviction that, dream or reality, it was a warning which I could not neglect. As she listened, a shade gradually fell over her sunny countenance, and she gazed at me as earnestly as if she would catch the sense of my words before they fell from my lips. When I spoke of the widow's weeds, she sank half fainting on a chair. A moment later, raising herself with an effort, and looking up, with eyes full of dreary abstraction, she said, Have no fear, my friend, have no fear. Do not leave us. It is not, it is not to you, but no, you never saw this, you dreamed it. Your heart was filled with thoughts of your wife. You fancied. You knew not what. You are not well. I have read that this. Then checking herself, she continued, But why should you go? Pray do not leave us now. I was moved beyond expression by the piteous sadness of her face. But still with the horror of the night fresh in my mind, I felt that depart I must. It was with a choked utterance that I repeated my decision, adding, I know the trains run today as on Sundays, and I shall have time to catch the parliamentary. Say anything for me you will. Make any excuse you like. Tell Godfrey that I have lost my senses. Tell him what I have seen. Tell Godfrey, she almost screamed, springing to her feet and seizing my arm. Tell him. No, not for worlds. And her face flushed with excitement, and her eyes gleamed. Breathe not a word of this either to him, should you see him before you start, or to any living soul. Give any reason for your departure rather than this. If friendship is not a mere word, promise me not to speak of it. Oh, promise me, promise me. The extraordinary vehemence and agony of her manner caused a strange revulsion of feeling in me. Why did she so earnestly implore silence? Promise? Of course I would but still I was determined to return home. God bless you, dear Lady Sequin, I said. I would do all and everything for you and Godfrey, but my wife, I must satisfy myself that no harm has come to her. Goodbye at once, goodbye, or I shall be too late. Leaving her with her face buried in her hands, I hastened out of the room. An hour afterwards, without having seen Godfrey or any of the guests, I was steaming towards London, my heart and mind busy with bewildering conjectures. How strange that my narration should have so affected my old friend's wife! Why should it have moved her so strongly? And what an agonized look she gave as she saw me drive away! The features reflected in the mirror were plainly those of Maria. To me, and mine alone, could there have been any meaning in what I had seen. How was it all to be accounted for? I knew not what to think, and it was only when I afterwards became acquainted with the legend attached to the steel mirror that the mystery was solved. Occupied by conflicting thoughts, and giddy with suspense, I at last reached town after the terrible delays attending upon a slow parliamentary train, and it was late ere I rattled through the quiet streets of Bloomsbury in the dusky twilight of a winter afternoon. The relief which followed the surprised but reassuring words uttered by the servant as she let me into my house, was perhaps the most pleasurable sensation I have ever experienced in my life. Nothing the matter? No, of course not. Everything remained as I had left it. If there was a change, my wife was a little better, but startled beyond expression at seeing me. A few words explained all. Certainly Maria had written, not on the day I left, but the day after, that is, yesterday, and I ought to have received her letter this morning, the morning of this identical Christmas day. The servant had posted it in good time, had she not? No, that was just what she had not done, for, upon inquiry, she admitted that it might have been a little past six before she got to the post office. Mightily rallied was I, by Madame and her daughters, for a dear superstitious old idiot, for remembering my promise to Lady Sequin, I did not tell them the cause which had mainly induced my return. I could simply attribute it to the want of news and the general apprehension of evil which possessed me. I spent a most unlooked-for, but not exactly merry Christmas evening, for great as was my relief, I found it impossible quite to recover myself or banish from my mind the remembrance of the extraordinary effect my narration and consequent departure 
had had upon Lady Sequin. Poor Godfrey, too, how disappointed he would be, disappointed in the very thing upon which he had set his heart and pinned his faith. Unaccustomed, likewise, to ghostly influences, I felt it would take a day or two to shake them off. I, indeed, I might well think so, for even now I doubt whether they can ever disappear. On Saturday, the third morning after my return, whilst looking for an answer to a note which I had dispatched to Godfrey immediately on my reaching home, stating how groundless I found my fears to have been, and proposing to retrieve my lost character by again going down to the bower, a letter in the handwriting which I knew to be that of one of our great friends, a never-failing Christmas guest of the sequins, was put into my hands. Its place is here. The Bower, Dankbro, December 27. I have undertaken to break to you, as gently as may be, the details of affairs here, since you so suddenly and unexpectedly left us on Christmas Day. Our good host could not recover your absence, and invades strongly against what he called your extraordinary and inexplicable behavior. Throughout the day he harped upon it, and not having been quite himself lately, as I think we may all have observed, he did not take it so easily as he otherwise would. At dinner, too, he was more strong on the point than ever. There was a lot of our usual friends here, and whilst talking of you, he suddenly began to count their number, exclaiming, Why, bless my heart, if his absence does not make us thirteen at table. And from that moment, all semblance of good spirits deserted him. Lady Sequin likewise seemed affected by some mysterious influence, and was far from well. The result was the most dismal Christmas day I have ever known in this house. Prepare yourself, my dear fellow, to bear up against what I know will be a terrible shock to you. The following day, poor Godfrey, with some half-dozen of us, rode over to Dankbro. Coming home, it was proposed that we should make a short cut across country, and off we went, rather glad of something to stir us up and make a brisk finish of it. The speed in our spirits gradually increased. One or two raspers were taken with great success by Sequin on a hunter he was trying for the first time. The brute had gone well so far, but in coming to a double post and rail, a rather narrow in and out, in taking his second rise, either missing his distance or landing awkwardly, no one knows exactly how, he fell, rolling over, we all suppose, upon Godfrey, for when we went back to the place, the horse was standing shivering with fear, and Godfrey lay stretched motionless on the ground, never, alas, to move again. We carried him home, and then, his poor wife. But I know that your eyes will be as dim, when you come to this part of my letter, as mine are now, whilst I write. Lady Sequin never recovered from the shock, her brain became partially affected. She had intervals, however, of perfect sanity. In one of these, and shortly before her death, she sent for me. Our interview was the most painful I have ever gone through. The result of it was a communication she made to me, and the purport of which ends my tale. It appeared that only a few days before this fatal Christmas, she and her poor husband had come upon some hitherto undiscovered papers in a secret drawer of an old cabinet. Amongst several anecdotes and records of the Sequin family, there was one which they read together, and which took great hold of the imagination of both. The story ran that such a vision as I had seen in the steel mirror, the ghostly reflection of a widowed woman, only appeared when a violent death threatened the head of the Sequin house. Its last coming was in 1746, when it had been immediately followed by the death of the first Sir Godfrey on the battlefield of Cullendon. Many previous instances were also recorded of its appearance, always with the same result. The End